What do you think is the greatest skill or a couple skills that any 20 to 30 year old kind of in their 20s should be learning how to master today from the skills of psychology, the skills of human nature, the skills of understanding people, which skill should that well, be to the, focus the, on? The, 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 the best thing is to be able to get inside the minds of other people. Ooh, there we if go. you develop that skill, the sky's the limit. Nothing will ever stop you because people are like a mystery. They wear a mask and you don't have any idea what they're thinking. And I, I have this metaphor in human nature, which I never wrote, but imagine a device was created in which some app that you could not know the thoughts and feelings of the other person. Do you know the power you would have? Wow. It'd be insane. Okay, you're not, I can't give you such an app. I can't invent that. But you can develop half of that power by becoming someone of insane empathy. And it's not easy and not everybody's born the same way, but it begins with a, one very simple step. And that is, normally you go around more interested in your own thoughts and ideas. You're thinking about your boss, you're thinking about your girlfriend or boyfriend, you're thinking about this person who said this, that, or the other, and you're locked in your head, and it's like a, a record, like in the old vinyl days, going around and around mm -hmm. and around the same grooves, right? And even when you're sitting there talking with someone on a date or something, you're thinking about yourself, you're still in there, right? Because you find yourself more interesting than the other person. And it's very human, and I'm not judging it. But inevitably, you think your own dramas, your own ideas, your own problems are essentially more interesting than the other person. So if that's, the, that's your starting position, you're naturally going to be more absorbed in yourself. You need to switch it around. And you need to tell yourself, the other person is more interesting than me. Mm. Their life, their thoughts, their ideas, it's like an undiscovered world. It's like going to Tahiti or something and visiting another culture. Hmm. They have experiences you've never had. They have a world that's not your world. It's fascinating. Why do people love movies? They love movies because they get to go inside other people's characters. Yeah. And they get to vicariously live in them. It's voyeurism. You can have that in everyday life hmm. if you switch that thing where you're more interested in other people. And so when you listen to them, you're not listening with the idea of, do they like me? Are they thinking about me? What does it have to do with me? I'm sorry I'm using that voice, but it's just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, blah, 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 kind of a whiny voice. What's it about me, 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 me? Thinking just in a Zen way, absorb yourself in their words and their energy and think about what, what they're saying. What's the subtext behind them? What's the body language revealing? What is it that motivates them? What is their inner life like? I can't get inside Lewis Howe's thoughts. It's impossible but I can get inside your moods and emotions because we humans are very susceptible to the moods of other people. We can feel them. So I can start to, if I'm open enough, hmm. I can understand the tone in your voice. I can understand the subtext of what you're saying and I can pick up the emotion behind it and what you're intending. And once I do that, well, then if someone says something, I don't have to take it personally because now I understand that it probably comes from other things that have nothing to do with me. Yeah. Or I want them I want to persuade them to help me on a project. Well now I know what their world is like, what their spirit is, what their problems are. I'm gonna mold what I'm saying to please to get them interested in my idea. Doors open up to you left, right, and center. The whole universe opens up to you once you put you're able to put yourself in the mindset and the, mm -hmm. the point of view of other people. Enter their spirit. That's the single greatest step you can have. So you're about to start your first job and you're all insecure and you're all worried about you and what people think about you. Try and make, it's not easy, it's not natural. Try and make that switch and don't think about yourself and try and figure out what is your boss like? What is he or she, what are they, what is motivating them? What are their insecurities? What are their doubts? What is this person feeling that? that? And suddenly you're gonna navigate this social environment in a much different level. Mm. I love this. This is powerful, I think. So to get in the minds of other people would be the greatest skill. By and, far. And the way to do that, I'm hearing you say, is through empathy, through asking interesting questions, through listening. No, it's taking this one step, which is other people are more interesting than me. I love going to see movies. 
that other person is like Hannibal Lecter. I'm sorry, that's not a, that's mm-hmm. not a good choice. <laughs> sure. Could be, but, or they're like this other character in some other movie. I don't know, choose whichever one you want, right? They're Beetle, fast. Beetlejuice, there you go. Okay, <laughs> wow, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Just thinking of a fascinating character. They're like that, they have, a, they have do- stories, they have drama, right? Their childhood was probably weird. Mm-hmm. They come from a culture, from a city, from a background that's not your city or background and to try and understand it. Now, some people are harder to do that with than others. There, there are people out there who are like just total assholes. And you don't really want to have to get into their right. world, <laughs> right. right? You feel like you're getting yourself taking a shower of mud or something or, mm-hmm. or excrement or whatever. Sure. You don't want to get into their world. But even then, it pays. If you've got a psychotic boss, it mm. pays to get inside their mind so that you can, don't take things personally, so you can understand where they come from. So even with horrible people mm. being able to understand who they are will will prevent you from taking everything personally so having the understanding that other people are more interesting than me having that framework in your mind allows you to look at them differently or as interesting or as they have interesting. stories to tell they have a life that's that's fascinating they're like a character in a movie mm-hmm. i want to understand it and asking questions allows you to understand it you have to be careful with questions because if you're so obvious, if you're going, tell, tell me, me about, about this. this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so did, your, did you love your mother? Did your father? Yeah. Yeah, they were like, yeah, why are you asking me this? Yeah. yeah. So how do we get to know them without being intrusive? Well, it's an art. So, um, you know, you, you, people love to talk about their childhood, mm-hmm. right? And their successes and yeah. Yeah, but I found like childhood is the main thing. Everyone has this kind of emotional attachment to their experiences as a child, to where they grew up, to their parents, to their family, to their earliest friends. It's got all sorts of emotions surrounding it that are very potent and uncontrollable. So a very kind of slip in question about someone's childhood and then asking a few leading questions and letting them do the talking. So if you're at peppering them with questions, you look like a lawyer or someone who's... A, <laughs> or someone a, like me who just interviews people for a living. Right. <laughs> so you want the, them to do 90% of the time. You can't um. 90% of the it's obvious what you're doing. 80% or se- people love to talk, right? If they do 70% of the talking, they're not even aware that they're doing that. But you're letting them talk, you're letting them be the star. But you find a, a foothold into their, what excites them and you get them to talk and open up about their childhood, and then an occasionally a question, and then occasionally you go into your own life mm. to sort of show, oh yeah, you had that, I have something very kind of similar. Mirroring people mm-hmm. is a slightly manipulative trick, I, I don't doubt, doubt that, and I talk about that in seduction, but it's very powerful. They start telling you things about their childhood that are powerful, and you go, yeah, I had something very similar, and you probably have had something similar. Yeah, That's a really potent way of connecting to people. But you've got to be subtle. It's an art to getting people to talk and open up, to finding that thing that lights their face up that gets them excited, you know? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, I think uh, the book Influenced by Cialdini, I don't know if you've studied that sure. book, but just likability allows you to, is one of his main, I think it's seven or eight keys of influence, but he talks about likability. And the more someone can see that they like you through mirroring or through, yep. we have one thing in common, makes them like you more. Yep. So finding that commonality, social proof, there's a, like a bunch of other things. Um, I can't remember all seven of them, but yeah, likability is one of the biggest things. It's one of the reasons why I'm just always trying to have fun and just be playful and, and kind of ease the moment for people so they can feel like, oh, this is relaxing and fun and playful. And- well, I must admit that's why you're a good interviewer. And I know that because I've, had, I've been with many bad interviewers right. <laughs> yeah. who are kind of tense mm. and nervous and defensive and they're insecure right then they make you feel that way and you yeah. but you have an energy that kind of brings out that part of at least for me that's, that's good yeah that likes to yammer <laughs> how does someone not be insecure an interviewer a uh someone trying to get a job and they're doing an interview with their potential boss when you're with someone who's you're inspired by or higher status or in a, a, a influence position how do you not be insecure or nervous Okay, one simple answer. I mean, there might be exceptions, but it's pretty simple. Do your homework, mm-hmm. be prepared. 
So if you go into an interview, you're naturally nervous. But if you've prepared, prepared the shit out of it, yeah. you've researched that person, you know who they are, you know what the company is like, you know what the position is, why the other person was fired, what they're going to need from you, you're going to feel a lot less insecure than if you just kind of go in and wing it, right? Okay. So if you're on any kind of project, I talked in the war book about Alfred Hitchcock, the film director. Mm -hmm. And my wife is a film director. It's a nerve wracking task. You've got an army of 80 people who are all bitchy and insecure <laughs> and ego-ridden, etc. Yeah. They're all secretly hoping you fail. So they can be the director, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a nightmare, right? And Hitchcock, would, like people were astonished. He'd be on the set, and he'd be falling asleep. Oh, oh, really? Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he was like Buddha. He didn't care. He was never upset or anything. People, how could that be? Directors are the most nervous, bitter people. They're so control freaks. It's because he prepared every detail he knew beforehand. Wow. He knew every shot that he wanted, what the clothes looked like, what the colors, how the framing would be. He storyboarded it in exact detail. And he said that by the time the film was being shot, I was bored because I knew everything how it was supposed to be. So he could be calm because he was so well prepared. So if you do your homework, mm -hmm. It's maybe not going to get rid of all your insecurities and all your nervousness because the lot, degree of nervousness is okay because you have to understand the physiology. Adrenaline is a very powerful emotion and feeling a little bit of doubt and a little bit of fear will drive you and keep, your eye, keep you awake and alert. So you don't want to be so confident that you'll just do anything. You want a little bit of tenseness. Yeah. But if you prepare and, you, and you've anticipated the situation, it will get rid of 80% of those doubts that you have. We were talking about before, and I have a couple of final questions for you. We were talking about before self-doubt before we started recording. And I'm curious your thoughts on doubt, doubting ourselves, and how do we train our minds or our bodies or our life so that doubt doesn't keep us from accomplishing with what we want or keep us from trying something we want? Because I think a lot of people don't do something because they doubt themselves so much from the fear of failure or the fear of success or people judging them. What's your thoughts on this? Well, um, the main thing is, is you have to try something. You have to do something, right? And of course, if you're full of doubt and insecurities, it's going to be very hard. And so what separates the person who is going to learn is on the way to success from somebody who won't will be that person who's 22, 23, they tries it, they do it. They take that job and they write that thing or they do that, whatever it is, that the other person maybe wouldn't try because they're not afraid of failing, mm -hmm. right? So a certain level of, you can't control that because some people are born that way. I don't know if they're born that way, but something about them in their DNA has, has given them that drive. Yeah. But if you don't have that drive, if you have your insecurities, understand Pain is a very powerful motivating factor. But if you're 22 and you don't try something, you don't feel the pain. So why not? And then you're 23, and then you're 24, you're not feeling pain. Then you're 28, you're still not feeling pain. Then you're 32, you're starting to feel a little depressed. And you're 35, man. And you're 40, you're picking up the bottle, you know, etc. Yeah. Okay. So understand that you're 22, that life is very difficult. And that you're gonna you're down a path towards something really really bad unless you get your act together and try that first thing, because what happens? People have studied fear, and it's very important. And I know. Back in 2001, I was in Vienna, Austria, mm. and I was watching. I was in a theater. I was in the middle of this this very packed audience, and there was a fire, and people were panicking, and running around. And I got such a sense of claustrophobia. It killed, I was like, ah! And from then on, I couldn't get on an airplane. I couldn't get in an elevator. I was like developing major claustrophobia, right? Mm. And then I went, I saw a therapist and she said, you gotta expose yourself. You gotta go back in that God, elevator. So true. You gotta go back into that airplane. And then you realize it's not so bad and you'll get over it. But avoiding it, you'll never get over the fear. So take that first step. Do whatever it is that you thought you couldn't do and don't be afraid because that is the most important moment in your life. And then you realize it's not so bad. Okay, people are making fun of me, I failed, but 
they never tried anything. I at least tried it, and I have an idea for my next, but it wasn't so bad, right. you know? But if you never make that first step, I don't care, the wisdom of Solomon won't be able to help you, right? You'll always be stopping before you can. So you've got to be, have the guts to make that first step, and then the doors will open for you. It's, what I'm hearing you say is it's an experiential event. It's not a theory of, okay, let me think my way out of the fear, right. or the insecurity, exactly. or the doubt. It's like, no, I have to practice this and experience the feeling of, ah, I failed, or someone laughed at me, or I tripped and fell, whatever it is. You've got to experience it. You have a good way of summarizing what I'm saying because you said it better than I did. <laughs> well, this is something I've been fascinated by because I think so many people are doubt themselves and their doubt is what keeps them from going after what they want, getting into the relationship they want, getting out of the relationship they want, you know, getting the job, all these things. And they're afraid of failure, they're afraid of success, and they're afraid of people's opinions or judgment when they take this action. And I, I tell people that the simplest thing you can do is write a list of your biggest fears and insecurities, circle the top one, the one that scares you the most, and then do that until you feel at peace with it, right. or at least so you can brace it. Essentially become Batman of that fear, right. and live with the bats of that fear, that insecurity, That's a good way of doing where it. then it becomes a powerful thing for you. And this is what I did in my teens and 20s from being terrified of public speaking and I went to public speaking class every single week until I felt like, wow, I feel powerful up here, not powerless. Right. And I did it with so many different things that I was insecure about right. until they became skills as opposed to fears right. and insecurities. And, I think, and so I love that you said you've got to expose yourself to the fear. You've got yeah. to re-go into the elevator, go back to that theater that had the fire right. and breathe and feel comfortable so you can live your life. And then we go back to the thought about, you know, that question, could it have been worse? Yeah. Well, think of it this way. If you don't try that thing, it's going to be a lot worse for you down the road. You're going to never get anywhere. And, and you're going to f the pain will be intense in 15 years. You're not feeling it now. But have that hindsight to realize that the worst thing in life, the worst feeling of all, is to see that you wasted your potential, Oof. that you had dreams and you never even tried them and then you're in your 50s, your 60s, you're facing death. Why was I alive? I didn't do it. I could have done this, that, or that. I never even tried. Remind yourself of that. You know, they used to have emperors in, in ancient Rome would have a slave walking by them and whispering into their ear, you're going to die, you're mortal. You might die tomorrow. You might die tomorrow. Right? And that was like a reminder of their mortality and that they had to not get so... Uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't that a story from Marcus Aurelius where he had someone talk to him and say, you're just a man or something? That or might be. That might was that be. who it was? I can't remember. But someone had someone just say, every day, you're just a man. Right. The more powerful he became yeah. to kind of keep, keep him more grounded. Right. You're just a man or you're going to die. Or just have that whisper, you're going to fail. You're, gonna, you're, gonna be, you're not going to realize your dreams. You're going to waste your life. You're wasting your life. You're wasting your life. You're wasting your life. You don't want to feel that way. I know, hmm. like, it's hard to, it's, it's, I'm coming from a position of privilege and I don't deny that. Sure. But I was not, I didn't have anybody help me. I, all my success was pretty much on my own. I worked really hard. But I can tell you this, that prior to my success, I was really unhappy. I was really unhappy. I was very depressed. I even had moments I was suicidal. I felt like I could do something, but I wasn't able to do it. And then the ability to write, write my books now, I don't have that feeling anymore. And it's the greatest thing in the world mm. to not ever feel like, you know, that, that, that doubt and that depression. It's like a constant exhilaration. It's amazing. I, I finished it. I wrote that book. I did it. You know, I, I can feel good about myself. And I want other people to understand that. You may not, it, it doesn't have to be a grand project, but it has to be something that makes you feel like, you know, because when you're a child, you have these dreams. Everybody had these dreams. You were going to be the best basketball player in history, like me, like I thought I was. <laughs> right. You know, the Jewish kid's going to be a great basketball player. Okay. You know, or I'm going to be the best this. I'm going to be a great writer. I'm going to be blah, blah, blah. And then you get older and you lose those dreams and it's very depressing. It's very debilitating. And you want to keep some of that ch child within you alive mm. and some of that ambition, some of that desire yeah. to achieve something great. 
And having ambition is not a bad thing. It's a dirty word today because people think it means you're selfish. Yeah. But your ambitions can be towards achieving things that help people mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. What's the greatest fear for you now that you haven't yet conquered or overcome or insecurity that you're still dealing with? I don't know, Louis. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I have, a, believe it or not, a tremendous fear of failure. <clears throat> mm. Like um, still, after all still, these massive hits and millions of books sold, and every time you get a, I'm neurotic and I don't deny every, it. Every every book is a hit and just changes lives. Well, uh, it's because I don't know if it's from my background. I come home with straight A's, and my parents would go, "Eh, okay, so what? Right. What's next?" Okay, so it's instilled in me some way, I don't know why, but so I'm writing my new book, my first chapter, and I'm going, this isn't working. It's, it's too intellectual, it's not gonna hit people, it's not relevant to their lives. I have to change it, I have to change it. If I write the book like this, people are gonna laugh at me. And I go through that every single time in every single book. Now I'm able, it's kind of a split personality because in the back of my mind, I know I'm kind of playing a game, uh -huh. but I still play the game. And it keeps me motivated and it keeps me working. So I must say, I'm still deathly afraid of failing my readers and of them being disappointed in me and going, I thought Robert was this great writer. And look, he's put out this sh and mm. what's wrong with him? He's getting old and soft. Mm. I'm still afraid of that. You want to be able to understand your emotions, right? You want to be able to stand why you're angry and not just give in to the emotion, like let the horse go anywhere so that maybe next time you understand, well, maybe I don't need to feel anger or fear because it's yeah. not really related to anything. So you have a balance.